On this edition of Native Report, we'll visit Little Bighorn National Monument in Montana. Ah. Ah. E. O. We'll attend the Crow Summer Institute. And we'll interview Crow Nation Chairman Darren Old Coyote. Our, our elders or our chiefs or warriors have fought for this land, this language, this way of life. We also learn about traits of leadership in Indian country and hear from our elders on this Native Report. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandon Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. Welcome to Native Report. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. Little Bighorn National Monument in Montana memorializes one of the last armed efforts by the Northern Plain Indians to preserve their way of life. It is a beautiful place that harbors a history that resonates in the present. The silence across these rolling hills is occasionally broken by the call of a meadowlark. This place is hollowed ground. This is Little Bighorn Battlefield. There's definitely something sacred about this area, simply because uh, the reason that these Indians, the Sioux and the Cheyenne were fighting was to preserve their way of life. And the reason the Crows were fighting was to preserve their way of life. Even though they were scouting against the Sioux and Cheyenne, um, all of the Indians had that in common, that they wanted to live how they wanted to live. And this was one of the last battles that the Indians won uh, defending that right. So there's something sacred about the land here and all the bloodshed. Um, you have to respect this area because so many people gave their lives. It's a very spiritual place for a lot of people. Um, this place has a very strong emotional punch. I've seen uh, first time visitors and repeat visitors in tears whether they're sitting here uh, enjoying one of the ranger presentations, learning about what happened, maybe learning something different from what they heard in the Hollywood version or their school books and, and history classes. Um, but sometimes just standing up on Last End Hill or walking through the Indian Memorial, the sense of place and uh, it's very somber. There has been much written and many movies made about the Battle of the Little Bighorn, also known as Custer's Last Stand. For Luella, the history of this place is very real to her and her family. As we cross over this cattle guard, we're entering private land. So welcome to the Crow Indian Reservation. On the other side of where the interstate now stands, they see a pony herd of roughly 18,000 to 20,000 horses. Now, with that many ponies, they knew that there was a lot of warriors in this encampment. I'm the great, 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 great granddaughter of Gozahead, who was a scout, also half yellow face. I am the great, 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 great granddaughter of him. He, he was Gozahead's father-in-law. We have Gozahead's account of the battle in the book Pretty Shield. Pretty Shield, medicine woman of the crow, she was his wife, and so she gives his account and it's really interesting because it's different than some of the more common accounts that we look at. And uh, I tend to trust that one more because she got it directly from her husband. And some of these other accounts have been kind of passed down a little further. So, but it's really interesting to do all this research and find out, you know, this is what so-and-so said and this is what so-and-so said. And then when they match up, you're like, oh my God, this is the truth. So it's, it's fun looking at all of that. All through the battlefield, uh, including down here on Deep Ravine, uh, there are white soldier markers indicating where bodies were found. Uh, the Indian warriors, each of the tribes would have come in and removed the warrior bodies from the battlefield immediately after the battle occurred. 
the army attempted to do on-site burials, but the conditions were really difficult. And within a couple years of the battle, all the efforts had been made to remove all the bodies from the battlefield. The soldiers, the enlisted men are buried up on Liston Hill in a mass grave. And the officers, for the most part, were removed right after the battle by their families and taken to maybe a family cemetery. In the case of Custer, he's at West Point. The park itself is 765 acres, and the battlefield is an estimated 11,000. On average, there are 300,000 visitors each year. What we encourage folks to do is stop at the visitor center and watch our really great orientation film. It's about a 25 minute video. And then we also have several different ranger talks that happen throughout the day right here on the patio. Um, they do a fantastic job of telling the story of what happened here on those days in June. And then what we recommend is that people drive the tour road. It's five miles out to the end of the road to the Reno Benteen battle site. And from there you can get as close as you can from the tour road to the, where the, the battle started and then work your way back to here sort of sequentially, if you will. And there's wayside exhibits all along the way. Uh, there's a cell phone audio tour that people can listen to along the way at each of those exhibits as well. It's a really important piece of American history and um, I hear our staff say every day, and if you're here later this afternoon, you'll hear me say it uh, when the Eric or Old Scout Society comes and tomorrow when we have Lakota and um, other folks here honoring their ancestors. For us to work here, it's a privilege every day to come here, to know that for the 5,000 servicemen, women, and family members that are buried in the cemetery, you know, this is their final resting place, as well as for those who fought here during the battle. And so it's, uh, in addition to being obviously a spectacularly beautiful place to be and to come to work, I was listening last night uh, at a meeting about the Sand Creek to a woman talk about the heaviness in her heart and um, all of the things that have been done over the years. And, uh, and yet in this place, for some people, there's an opportunity for peace and healing. And we really feel that with the Indian Memorial and our ability to tell a more balanced story now than might have been done initially in a pure army focus. It is a privilege and um, and a real honor to be here and to be able to, to share the story of what happened here. It's important to remember what happened here at Little Bighorn uh, because it is the antithesis of that clash of cultures. We're still clashing, but this was the biggest clash. I mean, so many people died, uh, so many Indians uh, survived, but it's because there were so many of them down there. Uh, they had a huge advantage in this battle, and hopefully in the coming years we can have that same advantage in uh, being recognized and being uh, allowing us to become more traditional and allowing us to become more successful in this other people's world. Describe your management style then. Whew, management style. You know, um, I, I need to relax now. <laughs> you do get stressed on some of these things, issues here. Uh, I think I, uh, sometimes I have to step back and think. And before, when, in my earlier term, I would, uh, what they say, uh, you'd shoot before you'd aim. So uh, I think uh, I've learned a lot to, to really uh, take a deep breath, think about it, think before you speak. Um, your actions and your words will do you harm if you don't think before that. And uh, sometimes I have uh, had, uh, what's that, foot and mouth disease, they call it, hoof or whatever it's called. But I mean, it, it has, it'll come back to haunt you later in life. So it, it's good to think, uh, go in with an open mind, uh, an open heart and speak from your heart and let your mind do the thinking for you. So, so uh, what, what other uh, personal values then help you with your job on a day-to-day -day basis? I think working with the staff. If you have a great staff, without a, without a great team, you're not going to succeed. And this is something we do push here. And, and uh, you know, you get the support from the tribal communities. And, you know, there's, there's those factions that, that, that feel you're not doing a good job in that and moving forward. But, you know, if you tell them the facts, you show them the, the truth on everything, you know, they can't uh, really complain too much about that. They are paying their bills 
and they are uh, working and, and stuff like that. So I think it, uh, it helps to uh, extend that to the, to the employees here because they are greatly appreciated. Without the employees, we wouldn't have what we have today here. Next, the Crow Summer Institute is a community event that empowers teachers with new knowledge, techniques, and tools for teaching the Crow language. But it's not just for teachers, it's for everyone that wants to learn. For two weeks during the summer, the campus of Little Bighorn College is home to the Crow Summer Institute. For educators, this is an opportunity to learn best practices for teaching the Crow language. Hello, my name is Rowan Hill. I'm a Crow language teacher through the St. Lebray School District. I teach at the, at the main campus out at St. Lebray. I'm originally a River Crow, River, River Crow descent, and I grew up in the Dunmore area from the Black Lodge District. There's only about uh, 1,500 Crow language speakers among the Crow tribe. And that's a little scary because even within this past week, we've had um, three or four deaths, and all of those I know, I know for a fact were Crow speakers. <laughs> One of the things that's really lacking with uh, uh, teaching Crow language is materials to teach. And a lot of times when uh, a Crow language teacher starts out, there's no materials and they end up writing a lot of their own curriculum and so um, with as many language teachers that have attempted to start a Crow language uh, program or teach Crow language, there's all these different curriculums. Oh, no, no. And so that was one of the things that um, we saw a real need for and now it's one of the things that we hope for is that um, the material that has been developed um, through the Language Institute that it would be something that would developed into it. Nowadays amongst the young people of why we're losing our language is due to the fact of um, laughing at one another, a form of embarrassment, discouragement. You know, when we say, when, we, when, some, when an individual says something wrong, they're laughed at or they're corrected in front of a lot of people and they get embarrassed. I was encouraged to participate in Crow's Summer Institute in kind of uh, ways of trying to learn different methods of teaching my language to kindergarten through fifth grade. The Crow Summer Institute is modeled after one that focuses on the revitalization and retention of the Lakota and Dakota languages. Both institutes receive support for their efforts from the Language Conservancy. We work with tribes and schools and other organizations around the country uh, providing language infrastructure usually technical help, uh, building dictionaries, uh, textbooks, helping to train teachers, other things that uh, Native communities might need to help support their language revitalization efforts. And so uh, part of what we do here is uh, assist with uh, teacher training. So this is the first year that the Crow Summer Institute is here. Uh, the previous two years uh, we held the Crow Summer Institute at Sitting Bull College in Fort Yates, North Dakota, uh, in conjunction with the Lakota Summer Institute, which is uh, in its ninth year this year and uh, a major event in terms of Lakota language revitalization. Communities are, uh, have been teaching uh, languages for, for many years, some from the early 70s, of course, but uh, bringing together experts in uh, the methods of teaching language and in the linguistics of the language just hasn't been there before. And so the Summer Institutes uh, help bring you know, leading experts from across the country to these communities, help teachers get these methods for how to teach uh, a language using communicative uh, methods, using TPR, uh, using all of the, the latest cutting edge materials uh, and making it fun for kids. We don't want uh, language to be some chore or something that isn't held in high prestige or in high regard in the schools. We want it to be active and fun and uh, accessible to young people. And to do that we need to train our teachers to be uh, active and fun and uh, relevant and making uh, actual progress in the teaching of the language. 
and that, you know, takes training. Wilhelm has documented the Conservancy's efforts in a film titled Rising Voices that tells the stories of young Lakota people learning their language. It's a film of hope, a film of inspiration designed to inspire other young people to say, hey, if so-and-so can learn the language, then I can learn it too. It's also designed to reach out to non-Indian audiences and let them know about the crisis that's happening with endangered languages in general. You'd be surprised that, uh, you know, most people think uh, in the United States that there was only one language or just a few languages, and uh, yet there were hundreds, and, and uh, many, if not most of those, are in either gone or endangered of extinction in the next few years. And, you know, it's important for the general audiences, uh, the general public in the U.S. to know that, uh, that these are uh, there, that they are held in, in high regard, that they're important for you know, the country as a linguistic uh, heritage of the country and, and of course that, uh, you know, communities value them very much and they have these uh, critical benefits uh, socially to the, to the communities. All things are interwoven among um, uh, Native American culture and language is very much an integral part of that. So I feel a real need to, to um, help in some way. I think uh, it's real encouraging to know that there's others out there that are trying so hard to help with it because we do have uh, the new app that's out on iTunes. There's also um, billboards and stuff around that, you know, and a lot of signs that are being um, put up in Crow, and I think that's a really good thing. It's real encouraging to the young people because I know there's uh, students that come to high school, they really want to learn how to speak Crow, and um, they ask if I could only speak Crow to them, which I think is outstanding. The voice starts to go down. I'm very fortunate to be hired as a Crow language instructor as well as a student advocate because it is my heart's deepest desire to bring back my language of my people. My name is Tylus Badbear. I'm from the Crow tribe, the Apsaluge, a child of the Whistling Water clan. And I think the best way to look at a wampum belt, it's almost like a cultural tape recorder. It captures the words, the memory of our ancestors, the agreements are made, very explicit detail, and, the, and it becomes locked into the belt. Subsequent generations pick up the belt, they're able to hear what the story is. This particular belt is called the Silver Covenant Chain of Peace. It's an agreement between Great Britain and the Haudenosaunee. On this side over here, the purple figure would represent the crown, that time the king, or today the queen. This figure represents our leaders on this side. They're holding a wampum belt, a symbolic wampum belt that goes all the way across the Atlantic Ocean over to their fire over there. When they wanted our attention, they would shake the chain and we would have a meeting. When we wanted their attention, we'd shake the chain. Sometimes we had to take, shake the chain a couple of times to get their attention, but that was the idea of the covenant. They wouldn't let anything cause such harm. It was destroy the relationship. So in order to maintain it, they called it polishing the chain making it bright again, like uh, silver when you shine it. That means removing all causes of harm, all potential dangers, so that our people can live in peace on both sides. So it's a very important historic document. This goes to the founding of uh, North America. We made a covenant chain with the French, uh, with the Dutch, with the English, with the Americans. So it's a very important political document as well. Darren Old Coyote is chairman of the fifth largest reservation in Indian Country, the Crow Nation in Montana. He is deeply committed in maintaining cultural traditions, but at the same time is striving to make a better future for the Crow people. The Crow Nation, home to three mountain ranges and two river basins, is the fifth largest reservation with over 2.3 million acres of land 
and 14,000 enrolled tribal members, of which over half live on the reservation. In 2004, I was elected uh, uh, by, the, by the Crow people to serve as the vice secretary and serve two terms um, and elected chairman in 2012. Um, youngest uh, uh, elected official um, at 31 years old, I was elected um, as the vice secretary. In 2012, I was elected uh, the chairman of the tribe and this year would mark, you know, um, 13 years as a tribal official and probably the longest serving tribal official in Crow history. A lot of people don't understand the, the magnitude of the, the land base we have. And there's a, you know, there's a lot of needs for law enforcement. There's a need for, for health care and trying to uh, get our young people educated. There's a lot of areas that we have to help uh, and we don't have the resources unless the, we get the revenue from the mining of coal. You know, it's it's pretty difficult to try to address a lot of the issues with with the amount of land we have, with the um, amount of needs we have as a tribe. There's uh, close to 14,000 tribal members. The last count was 13,700. So we do with what we, we can with the, that big of a land base. Two of the biggest issues for the Crow Nation are health care and the reservation economy which is largely based on coal mining. From the clinic and prior to the hospital here in, in Crow, you know, it'll take you an hour and 20 minutes to get there. If there's an emergency, you know, a lot of the people have to drive over an hour and a half just to get to the hospital here in Crow. So a lot of them just take the chance of going up to Billings. There's a new board on Indian Health um, to and look at ways of addressing the, the needs of the uh, seven reservations in Montana. What they do is look for ways to, you know, um, help establish a better communication with the state and, and, and the tribes, uh, whether it be the, the, the child benefits uh, or, or the Medicaid, Medicare um, expansion, helping elders and people that are in need of Medicaid, Medicare, and looking for ways to work together to better serve the, the Indian communities, because. IHS is, uh, you know, right now they're at a, they still have a 55% unmet need in Indian country. We've been mining with, uh, mining coal here on a reservation for about 42 years now. Two thirds of our non-federal budget comes from the mining of coal. Uh, we don't have a large population base to have a extravagant casino, you know, a big gaming operation like some tribes in the west and the east and half and in the south. Um, we are uh, fortunate that we, we do have a resource that's been sustaining us for the last 40 years. Chairman Old Coyote is active in preserving the Crow language and he is a founding member and drum keeper of the Black Whistle Singer's Drum. He remains true to the teachings of his elders, which gives him much confidence for the future of the Crow Nation and its youth. I grew up um, around many elders, uh, and uh, particularly my clan. They would talk to me um, and tell me things that, you know, one of these days this is going to happen. And um, it was more uh, talking to me as an adult, not as a child. I was always around the elders and I was growing up. So that's one of the uh, things that I, you know, everything they've said, you know, that a lot of them have come to pass and a lot of the prayers and wishes they I understand a lot of that, and they have a lot of uh, uh, concerns for the Crow people. One of them being the loss of our culture and identity, language. One of them was uh, loss of our land base, and those are two of the major concerns that the uh, elders still have today and, you know, had back then. I was taught by my grandmother that uh, there's only one road in life. Um, don't hold a grudge or don't hate anybody. Uh, you know, talk good to people respect people because in, on this one road of life you know you might need their help or they might need your help and always treat people with respect so that's what I try to live by. I would encourage young people to to learn as much from the elders because we don't know what tomorrow brings and you know we're, we're not promised tomorrow and to when you're sit down, sitting at the table to ask them you know, speak crow to me or to to say, you know, 
teach me things or just to be talking to them, to learn from, you know, because uh, they've been through a lot of uh, hardships. And, you know, some things that we're going through, they've already been through. So, you know, the best advisors we have is our elders because this ground we're sitting on is not just dirt. It's the blood of our, our ancestors that fought for this land. For more information about Native Report or the stories we've covered, look for us on the web at nativereport.org, on Facebook and on Twitter. Thank you for spending this time with your friends and neighbors in Indian Country. I'm Ernie Stevens. And I'm Rita Aspinwall. We'll see you again on the next Native Report. Rita Aspinwall is an enrolled member of the Fond du Lac Band of Lake Superior Chippewa and has a bachelor's degree in social work. Ernie Stevens is a member of the Oneida Nation of Wisconsin and serves on the board of directors for the American Indian Alaskan Native Tourism Association. Production of Native Report is made possible by grants from the Shakopee Midwakanton Sioux Community, the Blandin Foundation, and the Duluth Superior Area Community Foundation. <laughs>